When in doubt, stay mellow. Let's go, Knicks. It's deadline day in MLS. Okay, it's that's a bit too excessive in terms of excitement and building up towards what's going to be a pretty anticlimactic transfer window deadline day. Truth be told, this isn't usually a day that's super busy. The summer transfer window deadline is, is much busier, and that's just the nature of how the league works. We're, what, 10 games into the season for a few teams or maybe only one team? And that's just the nature of the way things go in MLS. Like, this isn't much slower than normal in terms of a transfer window deadline. The window has technically been open since early February, but essentially it's been open since every team got eliminated last year. So most teams had all of their stuff done ahead of the season starting. The ideal world is you want to get it done before preseason so the players and coaches have every single minute of preparation before the season. Then the next deadline that you want to get it done by is the first game of the season to maximize games played. Then there's usually kind of a lull after some signings come in, and then some teams panic or there, there's some leftover stuff that could happen in early April. So it, it's not going to be busy today. It hasn't been busy today, but but there's still a few things that are going on here um, because I didn't do a five-a-side yet this week. Let's do an MLS five-a-side on the transfer window deadline today. The first transfer window deadline day move has absolutely nothing to do with the deadline. Uh, Inter Miami are signing Matias Rojas. Um, he's last with Corinthians. He's an attacking midfielder winger. He made 30 appearances for the Brazilian club, but he hasn't played since February because he's been in a reported contract dispute. And the contract dispute is reportedly around image rights or some contract details. Payments haven't been made. And Rojas for the last two months, I think, has been it's been reported that he's been trying to leave. And, and Miami were at the front of the line to try to sign him. That deal is done. If you're listening to this, it might have been announced already. I don't know. I reported it Tuesday morning, and my understanding is that it's going to be announced and official at some point today. Um, so there will be maybe there will be more details there. Anyway, on the field, Matias Ross is a Paraguay international. He's an attacking midfielder slash winger. For me, this isn't what I'd spend my resources on. Like, he won't be cheap, but... I understand like why he's going to fit in this team, particularly now with some of the injuries and looking forward to this summer when Messi is going to be gone and whoever else is either going to be gone due to international duty or injury. So I understand the idea of trying to get a very good player in on an opportunistic deal and opportunistic timing because of the contract dispute with Corinthians. But for me, I would have spent my resources further back in, in the team somewhere in defense. The good news is the timing is very good. Breakout star Diego Gomez is out for around six weeks with an ankle sprain. Matias Rojas can just slot right in for him, which which is great because they were really going to be missing Diego Gomez. And, and we'll see how long it takes him to adapt and what exactly his play style is. He could either play centrally again, as I was saying. He's plays When he plays as a winger, it's mostly been off the right. Obviously, that's Lionel Messi territory. So whenever he and Messi play together, Diego Gomez had been playing at, at left wing or, or playing in like the half space between central midfield and the wing. So that's where I would see Rojas in a full strength Miami. And then maybe he can play as a right winger whenever Messi is unavailable or, or getting some rest. So that's good. What Tata Martino and this team needs is continual options. This is one of the deepest and strongest teams in the league. And they've needed every bit of that squad depth at the beginning of the season to chase. Their, their <clears throat> they've needed every bit of that squad depth at the beginning of the season as they are currently leading the Supporter Shield race with 18 points after 10 games. And this is going to be a constant narrative with this team. Who's in, who's out, who's around, who's on international duty, who's injured, whatever, right? Matias Rojas is another guy who you could put the workload on. Um, given his pedigree, his resume, his talent, everything else, the idea is to be to have other creators and other attack-minded players that, that can then drive the game themselves. That's why Julian Gressel has been so important for this team this season. He fits really well alongside Miami Suarez, Busquets, everybody. But in the, the moments when Messi hasn't been available... Like, he's somebody who can create chances at, at a very good level in this league and somebody who can, you know, he's not going to, you know, be an individualistic player, take players one-on-one, -on -one, go to the byline, cut it back. He, he's somebody who still fits within a system, but he can still create chances at a higher level. And Matias Rojas is what they're hoping for in that mold. Another player like Matias Rojas, that's kind of the idea as, as far as I understand. And as far as you can tell from the outside, more players who can drive the game forward on their own and that can take you know, attacking reps when Messi or Suarez or, or, you know, Robert Taylor is injured, right? Like going on down the list, the more like shot creators that that's t this team can have is going to carry them through the moments when they don't have Messi and some of their better players. 
and that's how you sustain a shield run. Transfer window deadline day number two. FC Cincinnati uh, have signed Kevin Kelsey, a Venezuelan youth international from Shakhtar Donetsk. This deal is a loan through the end of the season with a purchase option. I'm told the loan fee is 700000 which is a steep loan fee for a 19-year-old kid, particularly given he wasn't playing very much for Shakhtar, and Shakhtar um, were what I was being told is a little bit erratic during negotiations. One one uh, negotiating stance that I heard that they had is, you know, no, 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 we can't, we can't lose Kevin Kelsey. He's integral to our team. We, we just can't. There's no way we could part with him. He's played 750 league minutes over the last two seasons. Not exactly what I would call an uh, integral, integral piece of the squad, right? Um, he's a very talented player. It's a very difficult team to get into. So it's weird that that was kind of their stance of, yeah, we'd rather him kind of sit and rot on the bench rather than go and develop somewhere else. So Cincinnati have to pay up for a loan fee. He's coming on the U22 initiative. So the loan fee gets, you know, just kind of bundled into that. That doesn't hurt his salary cap hit or budget hit. So Cincinnati kind of paid up. There's a purchase option. I'm told it, it's very large. It's something like $7 million. Look, he's not valued at $7 million right now. But you can always negotiate this down. You can't negotiate a purchase option up from just talking to other teams about other deals um, and why loan fees are what they are. Or, uh, sorry, why purchase options are what they are. Because teams say, hey, we can we can always negotiate later. But for Shakhtar's sense, if he comes and scores 15 goals or whatever, and they put the purchase option at like three million, then like they can't negotiate that up since he just triggers it. So I couldn't possibly imagine a scenario in which since you're paying seven million for him. But hey, maybe he scores 20 goals and, and that happens. But I'd be surprised. Anyway, while Kelsey didn't get a ton of playing time over the last year and a half, two years, he was very productive when he was on the field. He had seven goals and two assists and like 750 league minutes over the last two years. And more to the point, he scored in his only Champions League start this year. That was against FC Porto in a 3-1 loss for Shakhtar. He's a target man, 6'4", so he's like, look, it's going to be easy to try to start to compare him to Brandon Vasquez. And in a sense, they did want a bigger physical player up top. And like, again, it's going to be obvious to draw the comparisons of Brandon Vasquez. He's an intelligent runner. He's a willing runner. So he's a little bit bigger than Vasquez. He probably doesn't have the exact same pace as Vasquez. And very obviously, because Brandon Vasquez just went to CF Monterey for $8 million or whatever it was, and was a proven starting above average, excellent center forward in this league. It is incredibly unfair if Kevin Kelsey is going to be viewed as Brandon Vasquez 2.0 or, you know, hey, the attack has been really struggling for Cincy this year. This is who's going to fix it. He's a 19-year-old kid, a Venezuelan youth international. He's got a lot of talent. But it's like, don't put too much expectations or pressure on him immediately. We'll see, like, they're going to bring him into the team, see how he adapts, all that stuff. Like, they're not going to rush him. They're not viewing him as, oh, our savior's here. Like, this isn't a DP. This isn't an in-prime player. It's another option for Pat Noonan. And best case scenario, he becomes a starter and he plays really well. And he and he kind of helps solve some of those issues just by his profile, his his ability to occupy center backs, challenge, like, physically, and, and make willing runs, that'll give Aaron Bupenza and Lucho Acosta more room to run. So again, while I'm excited about this talent, I just want to caution people, don't look at this as, oh, they just got their Brandon Vasquez replacement, and he's going to hit the ground running, and everything's going to be fixed and great. Like, it'd be very unfair for a player. Like, the U22 initiative has had, honestly, more misses than hits. And even with Cincinnati, I was very excited about Marco Angulo last year, and he didn't work out, and, and they had to loan him out to make room to sign Kevin Kelsey because that was a priority to get a forward in. Um, they had been in talks with Shakhtar for a while from reporting on this over the last month. I'm surprised that Shakhtar kind of came around and, and eventually agreed to this. So well done for Cincy for getting it done. And let's see what he looks like when he gets into the team. Transfer window deadline day, five aside number three, the New England Revolution uh, are acquiring defender Javier Arriaga from the Seattle Sounders. Um, again, by the time you watch this, maybe it'll be announced, but I, I reported this this morning. I, I was talking about it in a column on, on Monday about all of the, that, that Javier Yaga was kind of the central player in what I was hearing about tra uh, trade rumors with the deadline coming up today now. Um, and there were a couple teams in for him. New England were leading the pack. Seattle said, Hey, this is the price, you know, the deal could be done in a minute. If you, if you agree to it. Right. <clears throat> and New England did late, le um, <clears throat> and New England did, and they're just trying to shake things up. It's been an awful putrid start for the new england revolution under caleb uh, caleb porter this year things the vibes are very bad things are very bad and they need to change things on the roster ariaga had been with seattle since 2019 he won mls cup he's the ecuador international the club are from what i've been told very appreciative for how professional and how high of a character he's had since ben being benched for you know more than a year or whatever 
So they were happy to give him the chance to go play more. And in New England, he should have the chance to go play more. Dave Romney has kind of fallen out of favor from what I've been told. They've been trying to trade him or been open to trading him at least. Maybe I stopped short of saying full-blown shopping him around. But it looks like Ariaga is being brought in to be a regular player. Maybe the, the first choice pairing is Henry Kessler and Javi Ariaga. We'll see how it goes. Look, good for New England for trying to change things. Can't really get any worse. Um, so we'll see where it goes. And, and, and with New England, all the rumblings I've heard in calling sources around the league over the last 48 hours, particularly on the trade market, everything leads back to New England. It was like Ariaga was the most likely piece to be traded. New England are like we're at front of the line. Then it was, you know, the Romney stuff or, or you know, one line came from, yeah, New England are trying to trade everyone, which is obviously hyperbolic, but that was just the sense of, oh, like they're open for business. They want to change stuff. They, they're not happy with where they are. All those things should be obvious, but not every single team at the bottom of the table right now is doing that. So again, it, it's pretty minimal credit, but, but good for New England for trying to change their fortunes and, and, and working to see what they can shake up. Will Javi Ariaga significantly change things? Probably not, but at least they're working towards that end. There's some other players that I've kind of heard that were maybe available or, hey, you know, watch this guy, check in tomorrow kind of thing. And New England came up with those players too. So I think anybody who's available or any teams that are looking to do business, New England would probably be my first call. Speaking of New England, one, one more point. They signed um, Al Jazz Ivasic. He had been waived by Portland earlier this season. He's going to challenge Henrik Ravas for the starting job in New England in goal. So that's just one to watch there. Five aside number four. We're already to the point of talking about transfers that aren't happening or didn't happen in this window. That's just a sign of where things are at the end of the primary transfer window here. So there's two deals that, you know, there was a little, there was varying degrees of seriousness and, and closeness. Uh, first, first, Cape Verde international winger Helio Varela. Uh, Charlotte FC were in talks to sign him with a U22 initiative spot. Those talks were very serious and very advanced. It just didn't get done, and that deal's dead. Charlotte are not using the U22 slot this window. And the other one is Zion Fleming of Millwall. San Jose very much liked him. San Jose kind of were, were poking around and said they were going to make an offer, and to my understanding, they never made an offer, which uh, is unfortunately what I've heard you know more than a few times with the San Jose Earthquakes and their predicament and their lack of kind of deals and, and stuff, you know, go back to the Carlos Vela stuff. I thought that was going to have that had a chance to happen and they couldn't close the deal. But anyway, we'll start with Varela. Yeah. So anyway, with Charlotte, they're not signing Varela. He would have been a U22 initial winger. They're going to look at the summer where they'll have a DP spot, a U22 slot, and they could sign a significant TAM player. I'm assuming that means Max TAM, but it doesn't necessarily have to be right. So they could add at least three key pieces in the summer. And that's very exciting. It's been a good start to the season. I really like Lee Alibata. I know I've spoken about this recently. And then same thing with San Jose. They, they, they want a DP10, and, and they could still do that in the summer. One thing I wanted to say, and I'm going to probably dive into this more. I'm going to probably... <clears throat> Speaking of the summer, and I'm probably going to dive deeper into this over the coming weeks after you know talking to more and more people. Just the way that the calendar lands this year, both in terms of when the window opens and where the league is and the league's cup. Summer signings, at best, are going to have nine or ten games with their new teams. Now, for teams in, like, the top four in each conference, that's fine. Like, LAFC ended up winning the Shield in 22 and then won MLS Cup. They added Denny Buanga down the stretch. He didn't make a huge impact until he, he scored the goal that sealed the, the Shield. But before that, like, he hadn't really done that much. But there wasn't a lot of pre It's not like they were chasing points to make the playoffs. Like, that was a... That was a contender fine-tuning the roster, making good signings. And, like, so that'll be fine. It's just something to look at. For teams like San Jose, if they can get off the floor. Teams like Charlotte, who are going to be around the playoff line, I think, for most of the season. For all the other teams chasing the playoffs, the summer stuff, that's a big deal. You have to have deals ready to go the, the, the minute the window opens. And there's, you know, one or two games before the League's Cup break. And then the end of August is when the League will resume, or mid-August, whatever it is. And, again, you only have eight, nine, 10 games to make an impact. That, that's a, less than a third of the season. So that's something to watch this, this summer and just keeping it in your mind of like, yeah, summer signing is going to help. But like, if you're in a dogfight for the playoffs, like you, this is the squad you have for the majority of the year right now. So there wasn't a lot of urgency around this window because right now it's still very early in the season. But the other side of that is by the time you get to the summer window, there's only 
eight to 10 games left. So that's just something to watch. And, and like, what's also super interesting is there are better players available in the summer and it's much easier to get deals done in the summer because that's the global transfer. Like that, that's the most active, most important transfer window across the globe. Like right now, trying to sign somebody from abroad, it's, it's your best bet is you get a good player. Just that's not being used. Like no, nobody is giving away in a serious spot. Like nobody's like, cool, you can have our number 10, right? Like a couple years ago, Philly ended up signing uh, Daniel Gazdog towards the end of the window. The agreement was whenever we're mathematically safe, we'll let you have him. And so his arrival is delayed. Jairo Torres obviously didn't work out for Chicago Fire, but they agreed the deal, I think, a month and a half, two months, and like announced it before he came because the Mexican transfer window had closed because they they align globally. So like their January, their winter transfer window closes at the end of January. So they couldn't replace him. So they Chicago was like, fine, we'll let you have him until you know, the, our deadline day, right? Like, so that's why it's difficult right now to do things outside of the league. Why it's difficult to do things inside of the league right now. It's it, like a lot of teams can say, oh, it's early. Like we're not ready to give up on blank or, or to move on from blank. Like the most, the most desperate teams are the ones that are, that are driving the market. New England, right? Like Seattle, like Javier Yaga is not, is a backup right now and didn't cover himself in glory last week when he came in off the bench. So like, that's, those are the kind of moves that are happening. So like, just that's kind of why the, the that's kind of why it's it, it's not that busy right now. And also, like while the summer can be, while the summer is extremely important, it's just it needs to be known and realized that they might not have a huge impact on the twenty twenty four season. All right, last one, number five. And again, this is one that doesn't have to do with deadline day because this player can be signed still at any time after the window closes because he's a free agent, but. Still no deal for Carlos Vela. He doesn't need to wait till summer, like I said, because he's a free agent. But will he? There was a report in Mexico that he's he's going to wait till the summer. Or maybe he's just going to retire. And, like, Carlos has always been Carlos, man. He he, he walks to the beat of his own drum. And I, I love that about him. I wouldn't be shocked if he did retire. I hope he doesn't because, selfishly, I really like watching him play. And, and I hope that he remains in MLS and, and you know, selfishly kind of hope that he uh, returns to LAFC just because... I love when legends get to stay with their teams, but I don't know. I just wanted to talk a little bit about Carlos Vela because, again, like one of the best players this league has ever seen. He, he is the architect of the very greatest single season in MLS history. He had 34 goals, still a current league record, and 15 assists. And, you know, MLS includes secondary assists, so that's why the stats you're about to see or have a little bit of discrepancy. It's the greatest season I've ever seen, man. Like I can't tell you how special it was. He was he came here in his prime. He's been at the center of everything LAFC did. He's been, again, he's helped drive this league forward, man. And like, he's a legend and, and it just sucks that he's he's available and no deals have happened because like, I mean, selfishly, like as for us fans, for him, he seems very happy. Just go look at his Instagram and I'm, I'm super pumped for him. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that he's not doing two days to keep himself in shape. So even when he does sign, it might take a little while for him to get back to being game ready. And dude, good for him, man. Like, He's accomplished so much in his career. He's made he's made plenty of money. He's happy. Like, dude, good for him. Like, uh, I'm glad that he's choosing to do what he wants, and and he's not gonna settle to play just to play, right? Like, so again, I hope it is in the end for him. But just because we're getting to the end of the transfer window, and you know, one of the best free agents on the market still hasn't been signed, and and there hasn't been many rumors since the San Jose deal never happened. So I don't know, man. But long live Carlos Vela. I just wanted to go down the nostalgic lane here and, and pull up his stats from, from his time at LASC and at MLS because, God damn, man, man it's special. I'll do it today. Uh, MLS 5 aside, transfer window deadline day. Um, maybe this will look a little – maybe something will happen over the next few hours. I don't know. Stay stay tuned to my Twitter. Maybe there's something that in, in between the time of me editing this and putting it up will break. Who knows? We'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, see you next time.